Next, I'll introduce our um, new next gen generation leader this year, Lucy Palmer. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to introduce her. Uh, she is currently um, a senior research fellow and, and uh, uh, head of the Neural Network Laboratory at the uh, Flory Institute of Neuroscience and Mental Health uh, at University of Melbourne. Uh, Lucy is a native Australian. She got her PhD from uh, Greg Stewart's lab at um, uh, Australian National University. And then she went on to do a postdoc uh, with um, uh, Matthew Lacron, uh, first in Switzerland and then in Germany. Uh, if you are an insider and know the names of those two labs, you probably will be able to guess that Lucy has been doing what can be considered as most difficult experiments uh, in neuroscience. And that is uh, in vivo wholesale patch recording coupled with uh, two photon imaging uh, in, in live animals. Uh, Lucy has been using this uh, great and, and extremely difficult technology to um, try to understand uh, how uh, information is processed in the dendrites of neurons. Uh, as you have seen in, in the previous talk and as well as in the beautiful uh, video uh, that Stephen Smith's group has generated uh, from the array tomography data, uh, neurons have elaborate uh, dendrites, some of them stretching very far away from the soma, and those dendrites are loaded uh, with synapses, um, and they receive information from many different places, both local information and global information from other parts of the brain. So the uh, information processing in the dendrites uh, is, must be extremely important. Um, Lucy has been doing some beautiful work there, and she's continuing to do that uh, in her current lab. Um, she, her research focus is to, uh, again, using those uh, techniques in vivo wholesale patch recording electrophysiology, and in vivo two photon imaging, and now uh, with optogenetics as well, uh, to study the dendritic activity uh, during sensory perception. And I think, you know, in her statement, she wishes to address questions like how the uh, input informations are integrated in the dendrites, uh, whether the dendritic activity uh, encode um, the animal's behavior, and how the dendritic activity is modulated in vivo um, by all kinds of uh, signals and the state of the, of the brain. And, and are the, uh, the, the inputs, are they clustered or not in different parts of the dendrites? I think those are the questions that many of us are uh, extremely interested in too, uh, although we may not be able to do the kind of experiments that she does. So I really look forward to uh, hearing uh, her talk. Welcome, Lucy. Uh, great. Um, well, thanks for having me, and thanks for that um, really nice introduction. Um, yeah, I mean, the experiments are, are, are fine. You, I think you just get taught uh, how to do things, and then you do it, and, uh, and hopefully they work out in the end. Um, but it's, it's a great honour to be here um, to present my work, but also to hear about the fantastic research that has been conducted here. So, um, so thank you. And so today I'll just be talking about work that was done yeah, in the laboratory of uh, Matthew Larkham. Uh, in Switzerland and in Germany, and also it's being conducted uh, currently in my uh, lab in Australia. Um, so I'll be talking about the function of modulation of, uh, of dendrites. Uh, how am I going to coordinate this? Okay, not with that. Right, okay. Um, so as we know, uh, the brain has areas specialised uh, for specific uh, sensory modalities. So you have the, the visual cortex, the auditory cortex, what have you. And all these um, different parts of the brain must combine together in order for you to, to generate an internal representation of, of what's going on in our uh, sensory surrounds. So um, basically you're all sitting there listening to me give this talk. Um, your, your visual cortex is being uh, activated, you're looking at me or you're looking at the slides, you're listening to what I'm saying, so the auditory cortex is also being active. And somehow all this information has to combine within the brain um, to kind of, so you get a, a full idea of what, what I'm trying to say. Um, and exactly how the brain does this, uh, we don't know. And there are different levels of the kind of the, the functional um, physiology uh, levels um, that you can use to kind of address how the brain um, actually does this. Um, you can look at the level of, of individual uh, spines. This is where the input comes into um, 
into the neurons and you can look to see whether the input is clustered or um, exactly when, when certain spines are activated. Uh, you can look at the level of dendrites, so um, these are the regions of the neurons that receive the um, information. We now know that dendrites do a very important um, computation themselves. Uh, you can look at the level of network, so you can just look at you know, one uh, particular region of the brain and then you can see um, you know, when it's active, when it's not active in response to certain uh, stimuli. And then you can kind of compare diff the activity of different regions uh, during certain stimuli and then you can kind of make inference as to what input they might um, actually be um, passing on to each other. And so all of my research is actually based on looking at dendrites. So we're bas basically trying to understand how the sensory environment is encoded um, within the brain by looking at the activity of dendrites. Okay, so why do neurons have dendrites? Um, often, I mean modelling we just heard about, often they're, they're ignored, but they, they are very important parts of, um, of a neuron. Um, so it wasn't quite realised how important they were, so 50 odd years ago people just thought they were just basically with surface areas, um, so inputs can come in. So of course neurons receive thousands of inputs, this guy here receives about 17,000 inputs and of course you need the surface area to, to provide um, you know, area for these synaptic inputs to, to occur on to and people used to think well dendrites were just basically surface areas for inputs to come in and then the, they, they basically just served as a cable to get information from to say up here down to the to the soma or the axon to generate an action potential um, but we now know even though dendrites I mean they're beautiful right so these are uh, neurons from all different brain regions from all different species even and they basically make up the, you know, when you think of looking at a neuron, you're, you're essentially looking at the morphology of the dendrites, and so they really do define uh, neurons. And we now know that they're not just um, providing surface area, that they're actually um, having computation um, of themselves, and they're not just passive. Okay, so uh, in this talk, I'll be talking about this guy, the, uh, the cortical pyramidal neuron. And just quickly, you can categorize the dendrites into uh, specific uh, regions. So you have the tough dendrite, that is attached to the, to the soma via the apical dendrite. You have obliques hanging off the apical and basal dendrites are off the, the soma. And I'll largely be talking about the, the tough dendrites. Um, okay, so all of my research is conducted in the primary somatosensory cortex, which is a six layered structure. Um, it re receives um, sensory inf information, comes from the external world um, to the thalamus, largely lands into layer four, goes up to layer two, three, down to layer five, six, and then, and then out of the cortex. And this is called a feed forward input. Uh, the cortex also receives um, feedback input. So this is input that comes um, from the thalamus, so it's essentially pre-processed input. Um, and it also receives um, information um, from other brain regions. Um, again, this is called feedback input. This is input that's, that's come from other brain regions, has already been processed, and then it's kind of feeding back onto the rest of the brain and providing really important um, information that kind of ties the brain together. And you can see that where the input lies, um, it, it kind of comes into specific um, parts of the brain. So the feedback input is really um, located up here into layer one, the, the surface of the brain. Uh, feed forward input, um, the pure sensory input largely goes into, into layer four. So if we put uh, the, the neurons, the cortex, back into the cortex, so here you've got the layer five cell and the layer two, three cell, you can see that where the, the neurons lie actually dictate, um, well, where the dendrites lie actually dictate what in, input they receive. So you have these tough dendrites, they're up here at the surface of the brain, they largely receive this feedback input, that's input from all the other brain regions. Um, and basal dendrites and down here, they largely receive this feed forward input that comes um, from the sensory surrounds. Okay, so layer two, three, pyramidal neuron, feed forward input onto the basal dendrites, it's feedback input um, um, onto the tough dendrites. Uh, we know that action potentials are generated um, in, in the axon, 35 microns from the soma, so around about here. So you can imagine that the feed forward input that comes onto the basal dendrites are in really close um, approximation to where um, action potentials are generated. So basically you could kind of say, well, feed forward input would have more of an influence on the output or, or the generation of an action potential. So they, this input, the synaptic input that comes here, only has to travel a short distance basically. And every time that input travels throughout a neuron, it, it attenuates as it goes. 
um, feedback input, however you can see it's the exact same input but if it comes um, into the tough dendrites it has a lot greater distance to, to, to travel in order to influence the output um, of, a, of the cell and of course communication within the brain is why action potential so you really want in order for this information that comes onto the tough dendrites in order for that to be relayed um, to, to the rest of the brain and to neighbouring cells that has to generate an action potential. Um, so it was initially postulated that any information that came up onto the, the tough dendrites basically was only for local computation and it didn't really influence um, action potential generation. So if you uh, patch onto a, um, a, a tough dendrite, which was done by, by um, Matthew Larkham a few years ago, um, you patch onto a tough dendrite, you evoke miniature EPSP, so you just evoke um, synaptic activity here. You record the activity in the tough dendrite as well as the, the apical dendrite. That what you see is that you're able to, to record these um, synaptic events um, in the tough dendrites, but by the time the synaptic events have travelled down the dendrite along the apical dendrite, they're essentially been attenuated. So you really can't see um, any, uh, any voltage in the apical dendrite and certainly by the time it reaches the axon uh, where action potential is generated, this information is essentially lost uh, to the rest of the brain and it's not passed on. Um, so that's um, miniature PSPs, and in, but we now know that um, the dendrites, probably about 10 years ago, it was discovered that, that dendrites aren't just passive, that they're actually active and they're able to generate events in themselves that kind of um, better propel information from these far regions up here down to, to generate action potentials. So um, if you patch onto a tough dendrite and you bring an extracellular stimulating pipette up close to the dendrite of interest, you um, do paired pulse stimulation, then at a certain threshold, you generate these large voltage events here. Um, they're sensitive to APV, so the, if you block the NMDA channels, then they're unable to be evoked. Uh, therefore, these are called um, NMDA spikes. These are non-threshold um, events. Um, I mean, not non-threshold. Uh, they are thresholded, non-linear events. Um, likewise, if you patch onto the apical dendrite, and if you um, put current injection into this um, recording pipette, then at a certain threshold, you get these large events that, that occur. Um, these are sensitive to, to blocking calcium channels, so these are being called calcium spikes. Um, and importantly, what we know is that if you generate these dendritic spikes, either the NMDA or the, the calcium spikes, um, that they actually are able to influence action potential generation. So here you've patched onto the tough dendrite and um, onto the apical dendrite. This is by Matthew um, Larkham. And if you just do subthreshold um, um, input into the tuft, then this black trace here at the soma, you can see subthreshold. No, uh, you can't see anything at the soma. However, if you evoke these dendritic spikes, an MDA spike or a calcium spike, then you get these action potentials. So this is a way that a neuron um, is able to get this all important feedback information. That's the input that comes from different regions of the brain um, and kind of combines the brain together. And so by generating dendritic spikes, individual neurons are able to, to actually kind of um, pass on this information. So any information that comes up here is able to be passed on to neighboring neurons if a dendritic spike has been um, initiated. Okay, so what we know so far um, is that NMDA spikes can be generated in basal dendrites and also tough dendrites. Calcium spikes are initiated at the bifurcation point of apical dendrites. Um, action potentials back propagate. But um, everything that we know or knew um, was basically done from in vitro, from brain slice studies. So um, we didn't actually know if this is what's happening in the, in the brain, in, in neurons within the intact brain, because we know that the in vivo situation is very different. As I said in the introduction, you have the input that comes into the different uh, regions and the input, of course, has um, different patterns of input. Uh, we also have all the different um, cell types, both excitatory and also inhibitory. So we were unsure as to whether dendritic spikes that appear to be really important in getting information from, you know, this feedback information passed on within, within the brain, we didn't actually know whether they occurred um, in, the, in the, the living brain, basically. Okay, so uh, in this talk, I'll, I'll talk about two things. Uh, basically, uh, we first of all just wanted to see whether dendritic spikes actually do occur in vivo, and then um, whether, if they do occur, um, whether um, dendritic activity can actually be uh, modulated by, by um, further feedback 
um, input or multi-sensory input. Okay, so the technique that we use to address this um, is um, all in this first study, um, just recording from layer two, three pyramidal neurons, primary somatosensory cortex in urethane um, anaesthetized rats. Uh, we always do intrinsic imaging to start with, so we always know that we're in the, the hind limb area of the primary somatosensory cortex. Uh, we literally just bring in a, a patch pipette, uh, we patch onto a layer two, three pyramidal neuron, um, we, we fill this, this cell with a synthetic calcium indicator, Oregon Green BAPTA1. We hope to hold on to, on to the, um, the, the whole cell recording for approximately an hour to allow the, the dye to, um, to fill all the dendritic tree. And then uh, once we do that, then we're able to um, basically uh, you can see it here. You can see all the different regions of the dendrite that's been filled with this calcium indicator. So we could basically go in with a two photon and just image any dendritic region. Um, hopefully we still retain the, the whole cell recording. So at the same time, we're able to image the calcium transients in the, the dendrite, any dendrite that we're interested in, um, and also see what's happening at the soma. So kind of try to correlate the dendritic activity to the somatic um, output. Okay, so this is just... Um, an example yeah, it's plain, um, of the kind of raw data that, that we see. So this here is just um, uh, unfiltered, just raw data coming in, showing the, the calcium uh, transient. Sorry, that's supposed to stay. Um, and then this here is just the, the change in, in uh, calcium that, that we record. Um, okay, and just, this is, I can't see if it's still plain. No, okay. Um, so at the end of the day, this is kind of data that we get. We get these large calcium transients, I should say, sorry, that um, I'm really interested in feedback input. So all the data I'll be showing you is from uh, calcium transients from tough dendrites. So this is uh, these guys up here that receive this, this, this feedback input. Okay, so um, at the end of the day, we, we record these calcium transients in, in the tough dendrites, and then we see at the same time um, that they're associated with, um, with uh, somatic voltage, um, action potentials, or no action potentials. So basically, 90% uh, of the time when we see a large calcium transient in a dendrite, uh, we also see an associated action potential at the soma. Approximately 10% of the time, uh, you see these large calcium transients with no um, action potential at the soma, um, even though it might appear to be the case here, but um, it's, there's no correlation with the size as to whether it's an action potential or not an action potential. But from this data, we can't actually infer whether this large calcium transient actually generated the action potentials or if the action potentials cause this large uh, calcium transient. Um, okay, so just uh, very briefly, what could we be recording? So we're recording these calcium transients in the tough dendrites. Uh, they could simply just be uh, synaptic input. So uh, synaptic input comes in, um, opens NMDA channels, and you get a, a calcium influx, and maybe that's what we're recording. Uh, you also have um, sodium spikes generated in the axon. They forward propagate um, along the axon, but they also back propagate into the dendrite, and possibly we're just recording back propagating action potentials, which really doesn't tell us too much about um, how dendrites integrate information. Um, it could be recording uh, calcium from calcium spikes. So calcium spikes are evoked here. Um, they also forward propagate, but they also back propagate opening calcium channels, and therefore you'd see a calcium transient. Um, and there's also these NMDA spikes that in vitro studies show um, can occur in, um, in, the, in the tough dendrites. So opening the NMDA channels, you see a, a calcium influx and then you'll be able to record the calcium transient. So we weren't quite sure uh, what we're recording when we were seeing these um, calcium transients. So we just um, were basically able to eliminate uh, many things. So we know that the calcium transient that we were recording um, is not just purely backpropagating action potentials. Um, and we have plenty of data to show why it's not just backpropagating action potentials. But I, I think the most convincing is the fact that about 75% of all action potentials that we recorded um, just spontaneously um, weren't associated with any calcium transient in, in a den, um, dendrite region of interest. Um, so basically, um, only occasionally when there was an action potential did you see this large rise in, in calcium transient. Whereas if they were just due to backpropagating action potentials, you'd expect every time you saw an action potential, you'd see a, you'd see a calcium transient. Uh, we also know that we're not recording um, just EPSPs or, or just um, pure synaptic input. 
um, or calcium spikes. And basically, we know if you just take small regions of interest along the dendrite um, and looked at the calcium transients, you can see that they're spatially um, segregated. So if what we're recording were EPSPs, you'd expect them just to be um, this not the average um, spread of the calcium that we recorded was 30 microns. If it was EPSP, then you would barely expect it to, to cover five microns, you know, one micron, um, and vice versa. Um, if there were calcium spikes or even backpropagating action potentials, you'd actually expect the spread to be a lot greater. So we're looking at these quite spatially uh, restricted events, not spatially restricted enough just to be synaptic input, but um, not backpropagating action potentials or calcium transients. So we were thinking, oh, maybe we are uh, recording um, NMDA spikes um, that had been recorded in vitro, but people really didn't believe that they occurred um, in vivo. Reason being um, is the, the kind of um, synaptic input that you would need to, to generate them. So uh, you'd, you'd basically need um, about eight inputs into a 10 micron region. So you need clustered input. People, when they looked um, morphologically to see if there was clustered input, had said, well, they don't think clustered input actually occurs onto dendrites. Hence, these events can't actually occur um, in vivo. However, we started to think that maybe we were recording um, NMDA spikes. Um, so we just did a very um, crude experiment just um, placing APV, NMDA channel blocker, onto the surface of the brain. And then we saw that when we did this, we saw a decrease in the, the calcium uh, transients that we were recording. But this is a very crude um, technique to use because, of course, we're, we're affecting NMDA channels all throughout the brain. Um, so we then uh, looked to a... Um, to have more specific control over NMDA channels within a single cell. Um, and so we turned to an extracellular, uh, intracellular uh, caged MK01. So that's that's a caged compound that um, that can block NMDA channels only when it's exposed to to UV light. So we really had control on whether NMDA channels were, were blocked or, or not blocked. Um, so the advantage of using this caged MK01 is that we're able to include it in the patch for pets. So we just had an intracellular um, application. So it was only in the cell that we were recording from. So we weren't affecting the network at all. Um, then uh, we also had an internal control. So we could just record what the, the dendritic activity was normally. Then we're able to go in, shine a UV light onto the dendrite that we're interested in. Um, and then um, and then block NMDA channels. So we had a, the control before block and after block. Um, we're also able just to, to pinpoint certain dendrites that we were particularly interested in and to see the effect that this had on the, the output of the cell. Okay, so um, using this um, intracellular um, caged MK01, uh, we, we put that into the, into the pipette, so we filled a neuron with it. We then brought up an extracellular stimulating pipette right up close to the dendrite of interest, performed um, pair pulse stimulation to artificially evoke an um, NMDA spike or a spike. Um, and then when we blocked or when we, when we provided UV light, we're able to see that we're able to block um, this nonlinear event here. So we're essentially blocking the NMDA spike. And importantly, what we saw in the tough dendrite is that when we evoked an NMDA spike, that's this guy here, that the, 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 the calcium transient was exactly the same as what we'd just been recording spontaneously. So these tough dendrites are spontaneously active and there's probably about one um, of these large calcium events are one spike that occurs every approximately 10, 10 to 20 seconds. Um, okay, so basically we're able to show that, um, that we were, um, that, that tough dendrites are able to generate um, NMDA spikes and that they occur spontaneously, um, but we're really interested in um, whether um, they're actually evoked during, um, during sensory input. So um, the sensory input that we, that we chose in this case, we're recording from the hind limb area of the somatosensory cortex. So we just stimulate the hind paw with a single 100 volt, uh, one millisecond um, electrical stimulus. Um, it actually sounds a little bit dramatic, but it, <laughs> it isn't. So we test ourselves with the, with the stimulus every, uh, every time before the experiment. And, and it's, uh, it's just a, a short little, um, you feel it, but it's more like an itch. You just, you, you sense that something happens. Um, so um, we, we don't believe we're activating pain, pain threshold. Anyway, um, so what we see is that when you, when you um, stimulate the hindpaw in this manner, then approximately 20% of trials, you get this large calcium transient. Essentially, you're evoking an NMDA spike on 20% of trials, and then you're able to 
this is interesting. I didn't have time to really go into it, but if you, um, if you block NMDA channels just on one dendritic branch, you have no effect actually on the, the action potentials at the soma. So basically, um, the activity of one dendritic branch um, in respect to, to NMDA channels or generating NMDA spikes doesn't really have an effect on the action potential output of the cell. Um, and, and we did some modelling um, to show that actually needed approximately four to five NMDA spikes in the tough dendrite to have an influence on action potential generation. Um, and we, we showed that actually that does happen um, under physiological conditions. Um, okay. So basically what this study showed us is that um, feedback input along with feed forward input can generate um, NMDA spikes in the tough dendrite didn't have time to talk about basal dendrites, um, but anyways, you need about four or five of these NMDA spikes um, in order to influence action potentials, and that they can um, provide a signal of, of sensory input. Okay, but um, of course we know that sensory input is not experienced in, in isolation, and so we wanted to look the second part of this talk. We we're talking about um, whether um, dendritic activity can be modulated by uh, feedback input or other sensory input. Okay, so um, the other sensory input that, that we've looked at, um, two, I'll just um, briefly talk about two, two types. Um, Interhemispheric input, that's input that comes from the equal and opposite um, hemisphere, and in our case we're in the high limb area. So um, the, the high limb area of the opposite hemisphere, we're interested in, in what input this has or what effect this has on dendritic activity. Um, and I'll also briefly talk about um, some new data looking at more uh, within the same hemisphere um, of uh, four pore. Um, within the, the cortex, but what this, it's also considered long range, but it's kind of not as long range and it doesn't come along the corpus callosum. Okay. So um, just first um, briefly talk about interhemispheric input and what, what effect this has on, um, on dendritic activity. Um, so we're recording this case, it's layer five, but layer five pyramidal neurons um, and we're activating the, um, the, the hind limb area, the contralateral hind limb area, and to activate the, the interhemispheric input, we then stimulate the ipsilateral hind pore. And what we see is if you, in layer five cells, if you stimulate the contralateral hind pore, you get this large uh, voltage response, you get action potentials and also large um, subthreshold voltage. If you stimulate um, the, the ipsilateral um, hind pore, then you don't see any action potentials and, and, and no subthreshold response. However, when you stimulate them together, you get this uh, decrease in action potential generation. And what we saw, I don't have time to go into detail, but if you stimulate the ipsilateral hind pore 200 or 400 milliseconds before the contralateral hind pore, that's when you see this decrease in action potential generation and that it's mediated by GABA B, mediated in ambition. Okay, and importantly, we see a decrease, uh, a very large decrease in dendritic activity. So basically, um, when, you, when you activate the interhemispheric um, input, you get a decrease in dendritic activity that leads to a decrease in action potentials. And quite dramatic, approximately a third of all action potentials are inhibited by interhemispheric input. Okay, so um, where is this inhibition coming from? So cortical uh, neurons, or in the cortex, there's many different types of interneurons. Uh, you have the neuroglioform cell that specifically target um, tough dendrites um, and a GABA B mediating. Also bipolar and double bouquet cell, and Martinotti cells, and essentially GABA A mediating interneurons. Um, basket cells are somatic. So we're interested in exactly where within the cortex this inhibition that we're recording when you activate the interhemispheric um, input, where it's coming from. Okay, so uh, we turn to, um, to optogenetics in order for us to have um, complete control on the, the input of this interhemispheric input. So we put channelrhodopsin into the equal and opposite hemisphere, uh, then we had control of the neurons. We then um, did brain slice, so what we have in the brain slice is we have the axons that have come from the injected site that have conversed over the hemispheres and are now synapsing onto the neurons. Um, and then we're able just to record from all the different types of um, interneurons here um, in, in the contralateral hind, hind limb area. And if we shine, if we basically activate the axons that have come from the opposite hemisphere, then we're able to see where these um, axons are basically synapsing onto. And what we saw actually is um, that you had more uh, 
uh, synapses or, or stronger activation when you were recording from interneurons that were um, up in, in layer one or layer two, three than, than layer five. So basically what we saw what was happening is that you have these layer five cells that, um, that are receiving input from the opposite hemisphere it's synapsing in the top region of the brain, um, um, activating uh, interneurons that are then providing inhibition onto the dendrites that's then um, causing a decrease in, in action potentials. Okay, so um, now we're looking at um, long range input um, that, that occurs within the same hemisphere. Um, so in order to activate this input, we're again, uh, we're recording from the hind paw area, but in this case we're stimulating the forepaw of the same, the contralateral. Um, and what we saw, very similar to interhemispheric input, uh, we saw that uh, when you stimulate the, the hind paw, 20% of trials, you get this um, uh, large calcium transient, essentially an MDA spike. Uh, when you stimulate the forepaw, you don't see a response. And very similar to interhemispheric input, uh, when you stimulate them both together, you see a decrease in, um, in dendritic activity. So we weren't that surprised. Uh, we've shown that this is also GABA B mediated. Uh, we've gone on to um, do some direct dendritic recording. So this is in vivo. If you just patch on, instead of patching onto the soma, which we classically do, in this case we've um, we deliberately patched on to, to dendrites. Um, this data, I still have a full data set that really needs to be analysed. It's quite difficult to analyse because you don't just have an action potential, not an action potential. You have a range of, of, of large voltage events that uh, backpropagating action potentials, dendritic spikes and, and what have you intermingled. But what we do see is that you see again a decrease in, in the number of these events when you stimulate the forepaw and the hindpaw together. Um, but importantly, you don't see anything when you stimulate just the forepaw. Um, but unlike um, interhemispheric input, which causes a really dramatic one-third decrease in action potential generation, um, when, you, when you stimulate the forepaw, there's no um, effect actually on the action potential generation. So you're stimulating the, um, the hindpaw, you get an action potential, stimulate the hindpaw and the forepaw. In these neurons, you get the exact same um, somatic output. So essentially, this single neuron would have no idea whether what's passing on, it's not passing on any information, basically. It's not passing on additional information that the forepaw is also being stimulated, even though we know that the dendrite's been inhibited. Um, and this is basically because the four-pore stimulus, unlike interhemispheric input, four-pore stimulus actually provides excitation. So it provides inhibition onto the dendrites, but also excitation onto the same cell. Um, okay, so um, as far as um, stimulating different um, different input streams, we can see that even though you get um, dramatic, um, well, both, both different types of, of the feedback input that we've been looking at uh, provides inhibition onto the dendrites. Um, however, they can have um, different effects as to the output of the cell with respects to if there's excitation occurring at the same time. Um, okay, so this is all in anaesthetized animals. Uh, we're now turning to the awake uh, state. Um, we know that in the awake state, you get approximately fourfold um, increase in dendritic activity. Um, it's been shown. Um, so we're now doing, I don't have time to go into it, unfortunately, but it's also um, kind of very preliminary. But we're looking at um, dendritic activity um, in the awake behaving animal um, just by using very similar techniques to here, but chronic windows and uh, a genetic calcium indicator. And what we do know actually is importantly that in the awake state, just like the anaesthetized state in the in vitro state, is that there are um, NMDA spikes um, or dendritic spikes do appear, so uh, they're being evoked. So now we're really interested in exactly what behaviour these um, dendritic spikes are actually um, contributing to and what essentially what their importance is to, to the overall functioning of, of, a, of a neuron and, and the animal. Okay, so basically... Um, Hopefully I've convinced you that dendrites are, they're important. They're not just simply cables. They're able to generate their own, um, act, or their own kind of events that essentially, I always think of dendrites kind of as a gating mechanism, that they receive certain input, that they're able just to, to ignore it, but then, or, or not kind of pass on this information to the rest of the brain. But then um, when certain information comes in, whether it's clustered or in a certain pattern that they like or that they feel like this information should be passed on to, to neighbouring cells, then they're able to generate this large voltage event that then can, uh, can signal to, to other cells this information. Okay, and uh, I'd just like to thank... <laughs>
uh, members of, of my lab and also uh, members of, of Matthew's lab. Um, and everybody here actually contributed um, to, to these studies in, in one way or another. So thank you. Thanks, Lucy, for that wonderful talk. Uh, we have time for some questions. Hi. Uh, so it seems fairly surprising that the number of spikes which you obtain from a forelimb and hindlimb stimulation stays exactly the same, yet there are both inhibitory and excitatory mechanisms. Can you speculate how is it, uh, how such a perfect compensation can occur? You're talking about spikes, action potentials, right? Yeah, so um, we're really interested in this, and, and it's, this is just the tip of the iceberg in respect to how it actually happens. So what we have, um, some evidence for it appears as though, so the input's coming in from the, the forepaw, you stimulate the forepaw, you get the input coming in from the forepaw cortex, it goes to the hindpaw cortex, um, and then that's actually, well, it's going on to interneurons, it's then providing inhibition, but again, just up to the tuft. And then um, you also have input that's, that appears as though it's directly synapsing onto the excitatory cells, the pyramidal cells, that's providing the excitation. And then these combine together to have a null effect, but that, that we're able to, to see that you can actually influence it to be more inhibitory or more excitatory according to, to, to um, certain input. So, but it's, yeah, it was surprising for us. We, we just thought we were just seeing what we expected to see, but yeah. Actually, before the next question, uh, uh, next session is the lightning talk. We actually need to ask all the speakers for the lightning talk to go to uh, line up along the right side of the, the right stairs. Uh, I understood you correctly. You didn't see a significant difference between the anesthetized and the wake state. In terms of dendritic, uh, distal dendritic activity, we see we see a difference. There is there's uh, more activity in in the awake state. In in my particular experiments, it's hard. Uh, I've only ever and I should probably do the controls, but I've only ever used synthetic calcium indicator in the anesthetized state, and now I've turned to the genetic calcium indicator. So the actual ability to to uh, to sense these indicators is, is different. But in the awake state, um, in my hands, I can even say with using the two different indicators that there's um, enhanced activity. There's more activity. Basically, you're looking at dendrite; they light up like Christmas trees. Basically, well, I mean, in particular, with respect to the tiger theory that you know Matthew advocates, there's this beautiful classical experiment done by Victor Lame in the monkey, where they have um, in a wake monkey um, it does figure ground discrimination, and what they can see in primary visual cortex, there's an early response just to the local figure, and there's a, a, mm. a contextual ground response that's delayed, and that goes away under anesthesia, and the the speculation is, and I think it also uses your thing, anesthesia, the speculation is that the delay component, of course, is due to the feedback. But, but the, your data doesn't really no, yeah, no, so support we, that. I mean, no, but not saying that it's, so in our hands, we definitely do see both the feed forward and feedback um, instances in the anaesthetized state. But I think that in the awake state, that there's, that the, the combination of them is, is, uh, is switch, basically. You'd, you'd expect, of course, um, more feedback input. In the monkey, yeah, but, but you said it, th that's not the case in your data, right? No, it's not, but, in the, but still in the awake state, we see more activity. So I think it's enhanced, but we still see feedback input in the anaesthetized state. Beautiful. Um, is this on? Oh, yeah, it's on. Um, so you could you know, actually expect that there could be, I mean, you're doing nice, long-lasting recordings, and you could expect that there could be some phage, fairly major plasticity, homeostasis, nitric oxide signaling sequelae of those monster NMDA spikes in vivo. Do you see hints of that? Is that anything you're looking into? So we've looked. Uh, we, so with respect to just say we can compare the start of patch with the end of the experiment and of course we, we throw out data that we, we see differences in, in firing rates or, or what have you. Um, so we're in that way that's a control um, and we also with respect to imaging of course we, we always try to uh, have the control too is if we do see major changes then 
then the, the red flag goes up. But, but saying that, we don't really see, um, see changes. So if we're looking at a just spontaneous activity and look at a single uh, tough dendrite just to see what, what it does, um, then we see, we see over, we can record from the same dendrite for hours and we, we don't see huge changes in its activity you know, over the broad, you know, looking at a, a 10 minute time point at the start and 10 minutes at the end, we, we, we don't see, but we're not evoking, we're not, well, we're trying to avoid evoking any plasticity in any, of any time. Thank you. More questions? I have a question, kind of technical, um, but in one of the slides you showed that, um, I, don't, I don't remember exactly where you stimulate, or it's the channel, channel of the experiment, mm -hmm. where you recorded from layer one neuron, interneurons, layer two, three interneurons, and layer five neurons, and you f saw that um, actually the layer one neurons had the biggest postsynaptic response. Um, but um, the weaker response in layer five neurons, could it be that it's just an attenuation of the postsynaptic uh, potential or current because of the long dendrites, rather than that it's really receiving less input. So they were. Can from, you how, how do you confirm that? You've yeah. So so they, they were from interneurons. So the interneurons don't have that bipolar that right. the pyramidals have. So uh, it could be from from it could be that the input is coming onto the distal <laughs> dendrites of yeah. these interneurons, and that then it's attenuated. Oh, the more. layer five is. Oh, also the layer five. The layer five is that an interneuron? They're all no, interneurons. We just because we knew so colossal input, we know it's it's. Um, gluten maternity, we know it's excitatory yeah, yeah. and we knew that the end effect was inhibitory so it had to be synapse in non-interneurons so, so we, uh, we, we only recorded from interneurons so okay. I, all, all of that data was just purely um, interneurons so oh, okay. it, it could be then layer 5 it goes on to the distal dendrites in layer, layer 1, uh, layer 2, 3 interneurons, it goes more proximal and therefore you'd see this dichotomy we, we have evidence to, to this is, we don't think that was the, yeah, going on Question? Yeah. Yeah, just a question. Hi. Does that work? Yeah. Um, with the NMD spikes you observed, um, do you think the conductance, the influx that occurred, um, was occurring just due to conductance through the NMDA receptor, or do you think there's secondary to polarization of calcium channels? Yeah, so we've done those experiments as well in a, with the dirty drug, um, QX314, which is a sodium channel blocker. It also blocks some calcium channels, and we still see, actually, we see larger calcium transients. Um, so uh, we haven't done the, the experiments where we, we specifically block, just say, calcium channels by using internal drugs, and there are drugs. Um, D900, D600, um, that we could use to specifically block, but we haven't done those experiments. But by using this dirty drug that we know affects other channels, and we, we didn't see any um, influence. If anything, the calcium transients were actually increased, but that's more of an input um, yeah, resistance difference. But, yeah. Okay, let's thank Lucy again. Thank you.